have seen the lightning flashing and heard the thunder roll. I fell since breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. I heard the voice of my Savior telling me promise never to leave me, never to leave me alone. The voice your winds are blowing, temptation sharp and keen. I feel the peace in Savior stands between. He stands to shield me.
Praise God. Now, I looked to my left and I saw someone and I was quite amazed. <laughs> Sister Goodluck is in the house. <laughs> so nice to see you. I, I think she couldn't stay any longer. <laughs> it's nice to see you in church. And she is still on the recovery line. I noticed Sister, Sister Spence is in church too. And the ones who have gotten the unfortunate winter experience, they are recovering. And we are happy to see that God has been good to them. I, I heard that, I haven't seen Nick, but I see Sister Tomlinson is back. I think they did hit the warm sun, Sister Clark also. It's nice to see you all back in church. And all those of you who are from the Norwood Church, <laughs> yes, so happy to have you in the house. And we have no problem just, you know, staying with us for as long as you want. And I think it would be wonderful to invite you to, if this is going to be your place, that you take part in the worship service too. My church elder will be more than happy to incorporate your, your expertise and your talents and gifts in the service. Because you are all a part of the family of God. Amen? Amen. Let's all those from West Mount just raise your hand and welcome the Norwood brethren in. I think we need to let them know we are happy to have them. And they are, not, they are not intruding at all. They are all part of the family. And pray that God. And those who brought their babies to be blessed, of course, we are happy every single time you come to West Mount Church to have your babies blessed. And we hope that they all will become children of the heavenly kingdom. I notice I see Sister Martin in our little corner over there in the back. Sister Martin, I know you are visiting with us. So happy to have you. I know you're here to take care of your little one, or one of your little ones. <laughs> nice to have you. And pray that God will continue to bless us. I decided to preach a sermon that I have preached before. Hmm. But never the way I'm going to preach it like I preach it before. The reason why I want to preach this sermon, I think it's a timely message. I've been on the internet and I've been searching. There is a website that advertise all the latest development around the world impacting the church and the times in which we're living. And I realize that there is a certain kind of blindness that is affecting the church. And the church is in a serious condition, terrible condition. I don't think I can make it louder than I need to make it louder that the church of God, and when I say the church now, I'm not talking about Westmount Church per se, or the Adventist Church. I'm talking about the church of the living God. All the Christian church, we are in serious trouble. We are so loud. We are compromising at such a rate that I don't think we will recognize the church in a few years. Somebody will have to cry out somewhere or else we're going to be in trouble. But you know, I'm always fascinating that God has given us the message long before and but we tend to forgive it especially the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we are given the message for the hour. And this message has a clear, clear tone. We have heard it so many times that we become, we become so used to it that it does not impact us the way it should. But I'm going to take a little time and touch on a message that will help us 
to come to that place. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray, O oh God, that your spirit will attend unto the presentation of your words and that our hearts will be open to understanding. And not just to understand, but to surrender to your will. Speak to the needs of every heart, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, young people, I want you to listen to this sermon. It's very important, especially those of you in school. Listen to the sermon. Please put away every distraction. And if you have your phone, make sure it is on the Bible. Amen? It is irreverent to come to church and take out your, 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 your phone or your iPod or your ever and be playing games and doing things in church, especially while the word of God is being presented. You should at least, for coming to church, give your mind and your attention to the preaching of God's words. This is the time when God speaks to his people. Not because I am doing the speaking, but anyone who stands to speak the word of God. We should give reverence and attention to the word of God. Amen? So I shouldn't have to beg you to do that. In Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 14, that familiar passage we are new, he says, Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things said the Amen. And you know, when you hear amen, you know that's the end. You know, it's finished. We're saying, yes, we got it. The faithful and true witness. How, is the mic too loud? Okay, I just forget. Sometimes it gets loud, you know. You. The true and the faithful witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And this is it, verse 15. I know thy works. That thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art ne thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I might spew you out of my mouth. Probably. You know, down the line, I might just spew you out of my mouth. No, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not thou that, knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me, what? Gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyesight, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I like this. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore. And what, brethren? And repent. So, what is the call to the church? Repentance. And I believe the Christian church at a time need repentance. But here is the problem. The church does not see the need for repentance. The church is saying, we are fine. We are rich. We are comfortable. We are good. We are we, 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 we so sufficient in ourselves right now that to talk about repentance, repent of what? We don't see why we need to repent. But I don't have time to go into all the depth of this message, but there is an aspect of it I want to talk about. I want to talk about the blindness of the church. The blind state in which we are. Jesus offered three remedies 
First one, he says, I'm going to offer you gold for your poverty. And I'm going to offer you white raiment for your spiritual nakedness. And then I'm going to offer you eye salve for your spiritual blindness. So this is the condition of the church. We are naked spiritually. Spiritually naked. What does it mean to be spiritually naked? It means we are without the righteousness of Christ. How then can we be Christians without Christ's righteousness? That's not possible. And then gold tried in the fire. What is that? How can you even accept Jesus Christ without faith and love? And then of course, the blind state. Jesus said, I'm offering you eye salve. I ask you the question, what is the eye salve? Is it an, anoint, an, an ointment? According to the Laodicean, they were well known for their eye salve, for their ointment, for their eyes. They have that, and they felt that that was able to take care of everything. But I would like to read for you the Review and Herald, November 23. The question was asked, what is the eye salve? I want you to follow with me. Be patient. We're going to get to a very important principle here. The eye salve that Jesus is offering as a remedy. According to Review and Herod, November 23, Ellen White in 1897, so many years ago, Ellen White said, the eye salve is the word of God. Now, that is a very strange thing. <laughs> How could Jesus be offering the word of God to the people? I mean, you're talking about the church. How could he be offering the word of God as an eye salve, as an ointment to cure their blindness? That is strange because we have more Bibles today than any other book. I mean, think about the number of translations we have. We can't even count them anymore. Talk about the number of paraphrase and the commentaries on the Bible. We have so many. And yet, here comes the word of God in the last days of Revelation. And he's saying, the eye salve that I'm offering you is the very word of God. Something is wrong. The eye salve, the word of God, makes the conscience smarter under its application. For it convicts of sin. Aha. Uh -huh. Here we get it now. It is the convicting power of the word that, uh, that, that anoints. If there is no convicting power in the word of God, the word of God has no use to you. It's only a stimulation of the intellect. So therefore, for the word of God to convict it needs the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit takes the word of God and brings it to your heart, it brings conviction. Wow. So it means, therefore, if the church is blind, it means they don't have the Holy Ghost attending the word. So with all the preaching we are having, we have more preaching than any other time in the history of the world. And with all the Bibles we have, it's doing hardly any good to the church. For the Holy Ghost is not bringing the convicting power of the words to the hearts of the hearers. She says in Testimony Volume 5, if you think it's finished, what's he say? Page 233, paragraph 2, she says, The eye salve is that spiritual discernment which will enable you to see the wiles of Satan and shun them to detect sin and abhor it. To see truth and obey it. Wow, here we go now. Here we go now. So the eye salve gives spiritual discernment. 
the ability to see the devil in all his tricks and all the subtle way the devil can attack you. The devil has attacked the church to what they call political correctness and to what we call legalism. Once it becomes law, the church surrenders. So we shouldn't use marijuana for recreational use, but the law says it's okay and we, the law, the, the word of God says we should not, we should not marry same sex in marriage, but the law says it's okay and the church says. You see, the problem with us is we are blind. We cannot see the truth in the word of God because the eye salve is not working. And God offers the church the eye salve. He says, which enable you to see the wiles of Satan. The devil can't trick me with those things. And then he says, ah, to detect sin. The ability to detect sin comes with the discernment. Brethren, that's why we have so much problem in the churches today. What's wrong with that? I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't see anything wrong with... I don't, I don't want to call any names, please. I don't see anything wrong with... And I don't see anything wrong with... And we don't see anything wrong with anything. What's wrong with it? Of course I understand that you can't see because you are blind. If you were spiritually seeing, you would know that what you are is <clears throat> not right for you to... You see, brethren, spiritual discernment comes through the right application of the word of God. And when God's words have been accepted in the place that they should be accepted, we would have no problem. Well, you know, she goes on to say, the I salve is that wisdom and grace which enables us to discern between evil and good and to detect sin under any guise. There was a, there was an article, I was watching an article, there was an article I was reading there where <laughs> some pastors, quotation marks, were getting married. What did I say, brethren? Some pastors were getting married. Yeah. And I, and I was looking to see the wives. My Lord have mercy. And the pastors were getting married to their same sex. And they say they have come into the light. They have come into the light. And you better come into the light. Oh dear light. So you see, they're calling darkness light. No, the only time you start to call darkness light is when you're blind. And they're trying to tell me that I am blind. But brethren, we need to know where we stand. We need to know. So if the eye salve, the ointment, the cure, the medicine is the anointed word of God, bringing discernment and wisdom and the ability to see and understand and detect the devil in every guise and in every fashion he comes that we can see him and say, I see you, devil. Don't try to put any wool over my face because I will not be fooled. 
Young people in our universities and in our schools, they are teaching you all kind of nonsense, all kind of madness. And when we see students coming out of school where they should be coming out fully educated and seeing more, they're coming out as blind as bat. Spiritually blind. Intellectually, they may be brilliant and sharp, but in spiritually, they're as blind as a bat. And they come to criticize me? Can't criticize me. What is the I, by the way? If, 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 are we speaking about the literal I? That God is offering you an eye salve for the literal I? It cannot be the literal I. It's a spiritual I. The I, and listen to Ellen White, November 23, 1897. She says this in paragraph 5. She says, listen. The I is the sensitive conscience. Come on now. I'm coming home. The I is the what? Sensitive conscience. The inner light of the mind. Okay, now we locate the, we locate the I. The I is in the mind. You know it is your mind that makes you see. The brain is the organ of the mind, but it's the mind. And you see, I put my hand up here for my mind. Huh? Why do I do that? Because that's where the brain is. And the organ of the mind is the brain. But the, who, can, who can show us the mind? Nobody can show you the mind. The mind is an invisible entity. How big is the mind? That's another story. But the idea is your conscience is in your mind. It is said it is the inner light of the soul. Without that, you walk in darkness. And you have no ability to see spiritual things. Upon its correct view of things, the spiritual healthfulness of the whole soul depends. So if we are not seen correctly, we are totally blind. The eye saw the word of God makes the conscience smart and has application for it convicts of sin. But listen to this. But the smarting is necessary that the healing may follow. And the eye be single to the glory of God. The sinner... Beholding himself in God's great moral looking glass, that's the Ten Commandments, sees himself as God views him and exercises repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. We will not be able to see or be convicted without the Holy Spirit. Self-sufficiency is the fatal danger of a lukewarm state. The Laodicean boasts of a deep knowledge of the Bible truth, a deep insight into the scriptures. They are not entirely blind, else the eye saw would have done nothing to restore their sight. And enable them to discern the true attributes of Christ. Says Christ, by renouncing your own self-sufficiency, giving up all things, however dear to you, you may buy the gold, the raiment, the eye salve that you may see. That's Christ's offering to his church. The eye salve helps to detect sin under any guise. The eye salve is that wisdom and grace which enable us to discern between the evil and the good and to detect sin under any guise. God has given his church eyes which he requires them to anoint with wisdom that they may see clearly. But many would put out the eyes of the church if they could. For they would not have their deeds come to the light. 
lest they should be reproved. The divine eyesight will impart clearness to the understanding. Christ is the depository of all grace. He says, buy of me. And you buy without money and without price. What a God we serve. We can attain to the understanding of God's words only through the illumination of the spirit by which the word was given. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 11, The things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And the Savior's promise to his followers was, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. John 16. You see, the idea is one of the areas in which we are weak, one of the areas in which we are very weak is in the area of the Holy Spirit. The church is weak. Very weak. Because we, are, we depend on our intellect. We do a lot of talking. You know, if you go to Sabbath school, you can see how eloquent the church folks are. But when it comes to the spiritual things, in terms of the Spirit of God, it's a different story. Your spiritual remedy, your medicine chest is the Word of God. The Word of God is to stand as the highest educating book in our world and is to be treated with reverential awe. It is our guidebook. We shall receive from it the truth. But in today's society with humanism, the postmodern mind, pseudoscience, atheistic science and all the things and even among the society in which we're living, they are telling you today that the Bible is a hate book. And that book is obsolete, out of date, out of touch, interfering with people's lives, and we should get rid of it. You know that in any society, if you want to control the people, you have to make them ignorant. Huh? What did the Catholic Church do with the Bible? They took the Bible from the people. The first thing they do, they put it in a foreign language. They put it in Latin that the people couldn't read. And then they chain it on the pulpit. And only the priest could read whatever he wants to read to you. And the people were left in ignorance. And the church was pushed into what we call the dark ages. It was the darkest time in the history of the world. Because the word of God was taken away from the people. In France. I respect French people. And French people are wonderful people. And I'm not speaking. In France, when they wanted to control France, what did they do? They took the Bible away from the people. And by the way, we are reaping, we are reaping the whirlwind today. Today, my, let me tell you, the word of God is not popular. Especially right here in North America. They are working so hard to remove every sign of the church and every sign of religion from anywhere they can move it. I've been listening to some of the debates going on in the religious line between the, the atheistic science scientists and the, 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 the Christian church. And as you listen to these debates, you realize that there's one problem, the word of God. They refuse to even countenance the word of God. And anytime the, the, the debaters bring the word of God, oh, they, they want to vomit. Ugh. I was listening to Ken Ham debating Richard Dawkins. 
When Ken Ham talked about the blood of Jesus and Christ coming to rescue the world from sin, and when he talked about a spiritual sin, he says, that is petty. No, I don't believe in that. Uh, young people, let me tell you something. We are going to be ushered into another dark age. North America, Canada, as beautiful and wonderful as Canada is, and Quebec, I love Quebec, but Quebec is moving into a dark age period. They want to have nothing to do with the word of God. And we who are here raising our children in this secular, God-hating society, we maybe need to be careful. Oh, Lord. What did you say, Pastor? You're saying that on the internet? Oh, it's not on the internet. Yeah, okay. But seriously, brethren, it's serious thing in which you're living. I'm looking at my daughter and I'm saying, hmm, where am I raising her? In Quebec. Sometimes I'm talking to her and I'm listening carefully. And when we talk about some of the things that I'm getting alarmed with, she just look at me like, oh, daddy, relax. You know, I'm ready to cry out, fall on my knees and beg God to have mercy. And she look at me and say, relax, daddy, relax. In other words, she's been brought up right here in the midst of it. She is now sensitized to some degree. And this is why you need to become, you need to be aware that you are being conditioned. There is a level of conditioning going on and a lot of sensitization that after a while, you live like Lot in Sodom and you don't have a problem. Tell me something. How in the world could a man called a righteous man named Lot live in Sodom? Every day, Lot, get up and look around him, he sees Sodom. Sodom speaking to him. Sodom, his children married to Sodomites. Sodom, Sodom, everywhere. And he's still in Sodom. What is he doing there? The man should pack up grip and policy and move out of Sodom. Instead, he loves Sodom so much that he wouldn't come out of Sodom. I'm saying to us, you better start to take a note around you because this place is becoming Sodom. I didn't say becoming Sodom. It's already Sodom. But what, what are we doing here? If we are here and if we remain here, we remain here to be the salt and the light. We need to be the changing agent. We need to be the witnesses of God. You didn't hear me. Yes. I said if we remain, we must be the witnesses of God. We must be the one to remind the nation and show the nation the way that goes, that, that leads to God. Oh, I can't preach anymore. This because this is so much more. But the Bible, you don't throw away the Bible. Because if you throw it away, woe unto you. Because when the dark ages for 1260 years and the papal supremacy, the world have seen a state of cruelty and bloodshed and darkness and all the corruption that today the church is a scandal. I was listening to Dawkins. He has, a, he has a ball in beating up the church. And he wrote a book, The God Delusion. And man, he talks about the church, your stomach, you want to vomit. He said the church is the most diabolical and your God is the most diabolical thing the world has ever seen. The church has killed more people than anybody else. The church has persecuted and slaughtered the church. And when he goes on to the list and he goes down through the dark ages and he follows all the crew, all the massacre of the church and he just goes to and he just, and let me tell you, brethren, all you have to do, you really have to just cringe up and say, Oh my God, it's true he's saying, it's true. Do you know that the apostate church 
has been the worst evil on the planet. This is sad because the church was in darkness. That's why it is called the dark ages. But how did God liberate the church? He took a Catholic monk. <laughs> he took a Catholic monk and anointed him with the Holy Ghost and brought him back to the word. He received righteousness by faith. And when you read the word of God in the great controversy, Ellen White described it, when, the, when Martin Luther said, I release the word of God throughout Europe and throughout the place and a, and a, and a fire start burning and victories and doors start fly open and the word of God was what brought light to the world. That today we are living off the Reformation. Even though the Catholic popes have led the evangelicals and a lot of the churches, including the Lutheran, he says, the Protestant is over. You don't need to protest anymore because Papa Catholic is inviting all the children to come back home. Come back home, little children. Come back home to Papa. There is nothing to fear. You don't need to protest against Papa anymore because Papa loves you and Papa wants you to come back home. And all these Protestant churches are saying, yes, Papa, we are coming back home. And they start signing. I'm telling you, brethren, it's almost over. And if you are think I'm saying we are ushering right back into the dark age, by the way, you Adventists who seem to know the word of God so much, what is the image to the beast? You see, the image to the beast, of course, as the beast is the apostate Catholicism and all its agencies. Now, if we're going to make another image to that, Protestantism is going to become like Catholicism in its apostasy. We are moving into apostasy. And if you don't see that the Protestant churches are in apostasy already. Oh, Pastor Cousins, you're in serious trouble. Why are you talking like this? God's people are in every church. Come on now. So don't misrepresent me now. I'm only speaking the word of God. God's people are what? In every church and in every communion, God has his people and he's going to call them. And they're going to come. But what I'm saying is we see some things going on in Christendom today that telling us that we are shaping up for another dark ages. Because if you take the Bible away, hear my word. If you take the Bible away, we are in trouble. The word of God is a light to the mind. Without the word of God, society, it will be in chaos. I think it was Sister Angus who was telling me in the Sabbath school this morning that she learned of a case where the mother decided to bear a son for her gay uh, for her gay son. Be bear a child for her gay son. Can you believe that? The mother moved with love and compassion. You hear that? The mother moves with love and compassion. Decide to carry a child for her son. So that her gay son may have a child. Now brethren... If that is not blindness, then I am blind as bad. Because think about it now. God says, I created a male for a female. And male and female can produce children. Now you go male and male and now you can produce. You turn to your very mother to give birth to your child. And then you tell me that you are enlightened and I am blind? Well, I want to stay blind. If that is blindness, I want to stay blind. Virgin, you don't see what, if you don't see what the devil is doing, is because the Holy Ghost ain't working. 
That is crazy. I think I'm going to have to come to this point. He said, the Bible is designed of God to be the book by which the understanding may be disciplined. The what, brethren? The understanding may be disciplined. The soul guided and directed to live in the world and yet be not of the world is a problem that many professed Christians have never worked out in their practical life. Enlargement of mind will come to a nation only as men return to their allegiance to God. The world is flooded with books and general information. And men apply their minds in searching and inspired histories. But they neglect the most wonderful book that can give them the most correct ideas and ample understanding. You see, brethren, we don't have to look far. We need to stop reading the Bible like a dry literature book. We need to read the Bible under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we'll find answers. I wish I could continue this sermon for another hour. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I, I would like you to hear this. It is the eye that is blind. And the sensitive conscience is the eye of the soul. Therefore, the remedy or cure for, for sin sick souls is the anointed word of God applied to the sensitive conscience, imparting to it spiritual discernment, wisdom, and grace, thus making it a conquering power. I think I'm going to preach part two of the sermon because that will make it better. I need to take you into the, a little deeper into the conscience. And I am afraid if I start, I'm going to go for another half an hour. And I don't want to do that to you because the conscience, the conscience, brethren, is where our problem is. Just one little quotation before we leave. The sensitive conscience. The eye is the sensitive conscience, the inner light of the mind. Let me tell you something. When I was growing up, my mother would say, you don't have any conscience. When somebody tells you that you don't have any conscience, you are in moral darkness. You're in serious problem. But what is conscience? That's what I'm going to pick up next time. What is conscience? We, we, we need to spend a fitful thing to look into this conscience. And I want to talk a little bit about the, soci the, the, physio you know, the, the psychological definitions that we have and some of the sociological understanding of conscience and how the whole teaching of conscience in the area of psychology developed and how the church is impacted by the, by the teaching of psychology when it comes to the conscience. But the Bible has covered that concept of the conscience completely. But just before we pick it up next time I come, just one thing I want to caution. If there is one gift you can get in this life that would make you invincible, it is a sensitive conscience. Your conscience, listen to me young people, your conscience is that something in your mind. It's like a little annoying sometimes something. Especially when you're about to do bad things. And it there like a thorn. Like, 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 like a thorn. Or I, I don't know if you, those of you who used to walk barefooted. You know, you do a barefooted? Yeah. And, you, and you get a thorn or a, or, 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 or a piece of bottle or something in your foot. And, and you're walking around with it. And sometimes you're, you're hipping. And, and then sometimes your foot goes down and you, you forget. And your foot goes down and you, ooh. 
and, and it just hurt and sometimes start to form some pus inside of it eh? yeah pus yeah, it really and it become really sensitive and you have to let the pus out and get the thing out or else it's going to ruin your foot that's what the conscience is that like that it functions like that little thing every time you're doing wrong things it pricks you and pricks you here it is. We use what we call a technique. We develop a technique called rationalization. So when the conscience, say you're going to steal something. I remember when we used to go steal people's oranges over the fence. Yeah? And you're passing the neighbor, you see those, mm -mm, and sometimes the orange them just look so pretty in the sunlight. They're saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. <laughs> I, 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 we know we shouldn't pick them, and we squander the fence, and we pick them and run away with them. You know, it, you know so when the conscience is telling you, don't do it, don't do it, here comes my remedy, rationalization. Well, guess what? They have so many on the orange tree anyhow. <laughs> and they can't even use all of them. So nothing is wrong if I just take two. <laughs> you see how I'm rationalizing? And by the way, it was my forefathers who worked very hard to plant all these trees anyhow. And we have a, we have a system to rationalize it. And to make it look good. And that's exactly what the devil does to the conscience. And guess what the conscience happened to the conscience? After you work rationalization on the conscience over a period of time, it becomes insensitive. It cannot, you're not feeling anything anymore. And so that is why we can sin. Listen to me, I'm going to pick it up when I come back. We can sin and sin and sin and sin and we feel absolutely nothing because the conscience has become insensitive. So if you think the real problem with the church is homosexuality, you better think again. You think the gay and all of that stuff is a real problem of the church? It's deeper than that. Underneath that is that our consciences are dying. And because our consciences are dying, we can live in sin in the church and never feel conviction. So we are going to die and go to hell right in the church. You think the church is in trouble? We are in trouble, brethren. We have to find God's solution. And he says, you need my spirit. You need the word of God under his anointing spirit to bring conviction to the human heart so that we can feel sensitively when we do wrong. And I know when I was a young believer, especially a young believer, how sensitive my mind and my conscience was towards wrong. But as we grow in the church over a period of time, mingling with practicing sinners, we become dead. And let me ask you, you see Westmount Church? I love this church. You see, in the town, I would think I was going to say something else. Eh? I love this church, and this is a God's church, and this is a great church. No, I would do, yes. <laughs> but listen, brethren, we need to come back to the place where we reclaim our consciences. That is your best defense against the enemy. Next time I preach, I'm going to pick up part two. Don't forget. And we're going deeper into this because, brethren, this is the heart of survival. Jesus said this is the last message to the Laodicean. There is nothing else coming if you miss this. And by the way, oh boy, I wish I could preach this as another sermon. And she says the conscience is going to receive a little help. 
God is going to raise up some preachers in the church. And they're going to preach some straight, naked truth that we're going to hit the church with such power that it is called the shaking. Be ready, my friend, because God says all the dead conscience people, I got to get rid of them. I'm sending you the message. That's what he said. I'm going to spew you out. In other words, I'm offering you the remedy. And if you don't take it, you think I'm going to keep you? I'm not going to keep any dead Christian. I wish you were hot or cold. But because you are not paying attention to my message, and I've been giving you this for the last how many years, he said, behold, I stand at your door and I am knocking. Yes. What do you think I'm doing there? I'm begging you to take my remedy. So, brethren, this is a remedy to the church. We're only dealing with one now, the eyesight. May God help us. We go back home, take out our Bibles, pray to God and ask God to anoint us with the Holy Spirit that our Sabbath school quarterlies may come alive. And our Sabbath school discussions will be bathed in the light of the Holy Ghost. And our preachers who preach from the pulpit will be under the anointing of the Spirit so that God's word can have convicting power to the hearts of his people. May God be merciful to us. And may his word bring light to our darkened minds. Amen. Amen. Then trim your lambs, my brethren dear. Then trim your lambs with godly fear. The master cometh, draw it near. Let every lamp be burning. As we sing our closing hymn will be 595. Let every lamp be burning. Please stand, everyone. We sing the first, the second, and the last dancer. Dancer, then let's go. Work.